Hi, I'm Michelle Sterling for Friends of Science Society. About a month ago, under the wolf moon, we were concerned that there might be an incursion into the Ukraine by Russia. And sure enough, that's what happened. And now, another moon later, we're facing a time in the Ukraine, what's called the Rasputitsa, the muddy season. So ground activity for an army becomes very difficult in that time. You can look at the Cliff Mass blog and see what Professor Mass has to say about meteorological conditions affecting that region and affecting the people there. Now, one thing that this uh, incursion has shown the world is, first of all, that net zero is nonsense. We need reliable, affordable, oil, natural gas, and coal for modern society. And we need lots of it. We cannot survive on wind and solar. And all the people who say, oh, well, Europe is decarbonizing and it should be a simple matter, it's not so simple. If you look at Professor Fafari's work, you can see that he describes very clearly how Europe and Germany, in particular, put themselves in this vulnerable position by being so over-reliant on energy from Russia. And there are various reports out there that Russia actually funded the environmental groups to um, push Germany and the EU into using more and more oil and gas from Russia and not developing their own resources. Now in Canada, we see a parallel with the tar sands campaign. In, I think it was 2014, Canada had avoided the designation of dirty oil, which was the European community had come up with a fuel quality directive regarding the carbon footprint of oil. And they had tried to put the Alberta oil sands under this directive saying that our oil was dirty and incompatible with their needs. However, with a lot of work by the federal government at the time, um, Canada had managed to avoid that designation of dirty oil. And in fact, there's an article in the Financial Post where uh, Canadians are saying, this is fantastic. We've been able to get a small piece of the market in Italy, and we plan to build pipelines in all directions in Canada, and thus become a reliable, secure supplier of oil, gas, and uh, coal was not mentioned there, but oil and gas to the European Union. And curiously, <laughs> within about four years of that, all of those pipelines were blocked. So do you think perhaps some competitors might have been funding environmental groups in order to do just that? Or the other thing, perhaps they were funding environmental groups to squash and squeeze Canada into a corner to force us into global carbon trading. Because if you look back historically, Alberta was the first jurisdiction in North America to have a carbon tax. We had a tax only on large emitters though. The general public were not taxed under that law, only the large emitters. And um, since that time, there's been an effort to try and create a larger carbon trading market in North America. For instance, California and Quebec do carbon trading. Ontario used to, but Doug Ford canceled that program. And in fact, at one point, there was an article by a former diplomat, I believe he was a diplomat or ambassador or something like that, who stated that um, maybe carbon trading, trading for tidewater, it was called, saying, you know, if you guys would just go along with the carbon trading scheme, maybe you could get your pipelines to tidewater. Well, carbon trading is effectively a global equalization plan. What it does is it transfers money from fossil fuel rich areas of the world to places that are fossil fuel poor. Um, but it does so at the cost of consumers. And we see right now what's happening with the carbon tax in Canada and with the global shortage of oil, gas, and coal. Prices are skyrocketing. 
Now another interesting thing here is that the World Economic Forum ran their crazy little video a few years ago predicting that by 2030 you'd own nothing and you'd be happy. And not only that, that there would be a global price on carbon. Now, if you look at what Russia's policy has been on climate change, climate change policies are destructive to human civilization. They've always taken a really hard line on it. And we happen to have a PowerPoint that one of their representatives presented in 2004 that came to us via the Clintel network. And you can look at it and see what they say. Now, in terms of climate science, ironically, the only climate model in the world that closely parallels the real temperatures that we are observing these days is the Russian model. And that's the only model that doesn't rely on carbon dioxide as the main driver of climate change. And in the West, we have known for some time that carbon dioxide is not the driver of climate change. So it's curious that we continue to push for carbon taxes, which do nothing to stop climate change, do nothing to stop global warming, but they do a lot to mess up the market for individuals like you and I and for corporations. Part of the reason why there's a shortage of oil and natural gas and why prices are skyrocketing is that these environmental groups have driven off banks, driven off investors, driven off insurance company. Inter influential people like Mark Carney have threatened companies with bankruptcy if they don't toe the line on climate change. And so most investors and most companies have said, you know what? <laughs> Why do we want to wade in this muddy pond? Why don't we just step back and we'll let people come to their own conclusion when they can't afford to heat their house or drive their car or uh, whatever it may be when they have solar panels on their house but then they have a week of foggy weather? Let them find out themselves what it is to live in a world without fossil fuels. I'll tell you what it is. It's green murder. It's death. So unless you are a subsistence uh, off-grid individual, you cannot live in this society without vast supplies of fossil fuels. For Friends of Science Society, I'm Michelle Sterling. <music>